World War II. Even for those of us who didn't live through it, the name alone is enough to evoke a bit of terror. Add to that name the involvement of more than 30 countries, up to 85 million fatalities, nuclear weapons, methamphetamines, concentration camps, overzealous Nazi doctors, and yes, the fact that even Hitler had a girlfriend, and how quickly it goes from sounding a little scary to becoming the downright stuff of nightmares. With all that was going on around that time, as one can imagine, it probably wasn't easy to really stand out. And yet one man, Haru Onoda, goes down in history as one of World War II's most interesting characters. Now, if you've never heard of the name Haru Onoda, then you aren't going to want to miss the next several minutes. Onoda was born in March of 1922 in Japan. At the age of 17, he went to work for the Tajima Yoko Trading Company. A year later, he joined the military. At the age of 18, he had become the Imperial Japanese Infantry Army's proudest new recruit. For perhaps the first time in his life, Onoda felt like he was somebody. He went to train at Futamata, which is considered an extension for the regionally famous Nakano School for Spies. When Onoda's training was complete, he may have appeared, being only in his early 20s, as any other ordinary soldier. But Onoda's elite training had placed him into a different category, perhaps even into a league of his very own. It would soon begin to show that Onoda seemed to view his duty a bit differently than did a lot of his fellow troops. At his school, Onada had been trained in guerrilla warfare, sabotage, psychology, and espionage. The taking of one's own life was never an option for a true soldier, Onada learned, and if by chance captured, ideally a soldier would embrace the opportunity to spread disinformation rather than to wallow in his own defeat. Onada's training was deemed sufficiently complete just in time for World War II, at which point the young soldier would be sent to fight in the Philippines. You could say Onada was a good soldier. He had the qualities of a leader, while at the same time he was driven and devoted, obedient and loyal, almost to a fault. Upon his deployment, Onada's orders included that under no circumstances was he ever to surrender to the Allies, who were of course the enemy forces, or to take his own life. Onada's own commanding officer, Major Yoshimi Taniguchi, also left him with one promise which Onada would never allow himself to forget. Whatever happens, Taniguchi vowed, we'll come back for you. Well, Onada certainly didn't plan to disobey. As the war waged on, the island to which Onada had been sent was overtaken, and at that point, just Onada and a few other comrades remained who had not yet either died or else surrendered. Having been promoted to lieutenant, Onada took on three more recruits, fellow Japanese soldiers. Together with his loyal men, he decided the best course of action, strategically, was to take to the hills. And very soon, Onada would find that this proved to be an optimal survival strategy indeed. Pulled out somewhere in the vast Lubang Mountains of the Philippines, Onada and his men were well hidden from enemy troops, but he considered themselves prepared should a threat ever present itself. The foursome continued to engage in guerrilla activities as well as shootouts with local authorities. Then one day, the first of what would be many leaflets to follow fell from the sky. The leaflets strangely read that the war was over, and it beckoned Onada and his troops to come out of hiding. Onada didn't trust what the leaflets said. He dismissed it as Allied propaganda, concluding that if the war were truly over, he wouldn't have just been fired on by local police. It just didn't add up, and so they stayed put. A while later, over the course of some time, more mysterious leaflets would fall from the sky. The next one, which Onada and his boys examined very carefully, was printed complete with an order to surrender directly from General Tomayuki Yamashita of the 14th Area Army. Upon very close and considerate scrutiny, Onada determined that this leaflet, as well as all subsequent leaflets to follow, to be forgeries, obvious fakes. Some kind of allied propaganda they were using in employ to try and lure Onada and his men out of the safety of their hiding spot. At this point, Onada and only two of his men endured. One had decided to fall for the enemy propaganda, and he had naively given himself up. As difficult as it probably must have been to hold out, Onada wasn't about to ever forget or go against his orders. And so the war waged on, and time went by, Onada never giving the idea of surrender to the enemy even the foggiest consideration. Continuing to stay true to the orders he had been given, one day Onada ran into a strange but interesting man. The man was Japanese like Onada, but Onada would come to say that the man named Norio Suzuki presented as a hippie. Nevertheless, the two men enjoyed their conversations together, and they actually became fast friends. Little did Onada know, but Suzuki had decided to embark on a journey around the world with three implausible missions in mind, and he would eventually need to take off again to resume his quest. Before they parted ways, however, Suzuki took photos of himself and his new friend, Haru Onada, and after Onada confided in his buddy about the mysterious leaflets, Suzuki also inquired as to why Onada didn't surrender. Onada made clear to Suzuki that, more or less, anyone could drop a leaflet from the sky, but having never forgotten the words of his commanding officer, whatever happens will come back for you, he remained put. 
Onada explained that he held out faith that were it the time for him to surrender, his superior officer would surely let him know. Along with his photos as proof that he had met Onada in the mountains, Suzuki came down and armed with his evidence, he told officials about his encounter and he reiterated what Onada had said to him about surrendering. Well, one day, eventually, as we all know, World War II did come to an end at last. The Japanese government didn't hesitate long to get in touch with Onada's own former commanding officer, Major Yoshimi Taniguchi, who at that time had moved on to exploring his career opportunities as a bookseller. The retired military man evidently didn't like the thought of letting a promise go unfulfilled. Meeting with Onada himself, he issued to Onada the official orders for him to surrender. At this moment, Onada, ever the loyal soldier, did not only just know for the first time that his side had lost the war, but most importantly, he was finally formally freed of his obligation. Simply following his orders, just as he'd done this whole time, at last he surrendered. Thus, in 1974, Onada can be seen pictured here as he surrenders his weapons. Let me say that again. In 1974, Onada can be seen pictured here as he surrenders his weapons. 1974. The war had been over for one year shy of three entire decades, that is 29 years. Those leaflets falling from the sky had been legitimate all along, but without having heard it from his commanding officer, in whose promise he believed in ultimately, he was not going to think about taking the risk of disobeying an order. Perhaps happy to see Onada come down from the hills was his newfound hippie friend, Suzuki. He would soon resume his journey again, having fulfilled the first of his three impossible missions. One, find Lieutenant Onada. Two, find a panda. Three, find the abominable snowman. In that order. When Huru Onada emerged from his hiding place in the jungles of the Philippines for the final time, nearly 30 years after the war had ended, even though he'd begun his battle in tandem with three others, this time, the last time, he came out from the caves all alone. In the aftermath of the holdout, upon returning to his home country of Japan, he was immediately met with much reverence. It also had come much to Onada's surprise that he was greeted honorably and with welcoming arms by Philippines officials as well. That shock was likely due to the fact that in spite of being regarded by many as a heroic figure of World War II, there's still a faction of scholars that will eagerly debate Onada's status as such. While holed up in the caves of the Lubang Mountains, it is said that Onada and his camp would terrorize the island natives, a population of roughly 14,000. As the story goes, Onada and company took to various barbaric acts, such as burning the people's crops and looting their homes. By the time Onada emerged from hiding alone, two of his comrades had been killed in one of these less than pleasant encounters with the locals. It is estimated that Onada and company killed about 30 of the locals as well. An article written for an Asian magazine which discusses a film made about Onada's life, aptly called 10,000 Nights in the Jungle, delves into the question of whether Onada simply preferred to create his own reality. As Peter Tasker puts it, Onada's world made sense to him when he arrived on Lubang, age 22, and nothing much changed in the next three decades. The author also adds that, highly skilled in the techniques of survival, Onada knew how to make shoes out of grass, brush his teeth with coconut shells, and construct a waterproof hut out of branches and banana leaves. His greatest talent, though, was for manufacturing his own reality and forcing events to conform with it. And many would agree that there are indeed enough events to bolster this theory quite well. Onada had only dismissed every piece of evidence that had been thrown his way. Among other things, a visit from his siblings was deemed to be a trick. A photo of his own mother and father were dismissed as a forgery, and even after obtaining a radio, nothing Onada heard on there could convince him of anything except for the idea that his cause was just and that his path was still correct. Ultimately, whatever reservations Onada had about himself, his life, or the world around him, in the end, it appears as if Onada was able to adjust to life as a civilian once again, albeit with some reservations. Although he continued to be a popular character in Japan, with admirers even urging him to run for public office, Onada was ultimately disappointed with what he saw to be the deterioration of old-time values in modern-day society. He also felt increasingly adverse to all of the public attention being given his way. So in April of 1975, he followed in his brother's footsteps and moved to Brazil to become a cattle farmer. He married and lived an otherwise relatively normal life, but he never gave in to pressure coming at him to confess to the stealing of food, burning of crops, and worst of all, the murder of about 30 Filipinos during his stint in the war. Nonetheless, the president at the time granted him a full pardon. Quite impressively, Onada lived to be the age of 91. He died of heart failure on January 16, 2014 in Tokyo. For many, Onada still remains a figure to be admired for his deep dedication and his strong will to survive. Throughout his lifetime, both Onada and his wife had established several organizations to help the needy. They also donated to numerous charities and were known for the contributions they made to help others. Today, the memory of Haru Onada remains alive in the jungles of the Lubang Mountains of the Philippines. Much of his living quarters have been preserved and are now known as the Onada Trail and Caves. 
Visitors to the Lubang jungle are permitted to walk through portions of the caves that Onada came to call home for nearly 30 years. Photos and sketches go to show just how elaborate Onada's hideout had become over the 29 years he called those caves and trenches his home. It is said that Onada listened to a stolen radio for any information or news that he was able to receive, and exactly because communication was hard to come by, or else primitive in those times and places, it should not be too surprising that Haru Onada was in fact not the only war holdout in existence. In fact, contrary to what is widely believed, Onada wasn't even the last World War II holdout. His record was just barely beat out by another soldier. A man named Turo Nakamura surrendered later in 1974, the same year as Onada.